welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad you've come along. And this is one of those times where I am certainly going to geek out with an author that I have appreciated lately and really grown to appreciate in my own study. But you're going to have to hold on because he's going to give context for the nature of, of many of the people who are connected to this kind of to this podcast. And that's those who generally a lot of times are in the pan Wesleyan movement, and we find our origins in the 19th century England. And so we have uh, Timothy Larson, who's going to be coming on in just a second. Now, before I get there, I want to make sure you know that this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we do that through a variety of uh, bachelor's, un, uh, graduate, uh, so master's programs and doctoral ministry programs that are helping us, are helping le young leaders or leaders in general be prepared to serve faithful churches. And secondly, we're thankful too that we have the support of Bill Roberts, who's a financial planner who helps people, particularly those who are serving in ministry positions when they have to calculate kind of strange things like housing allowances and the like um, to prepare for their own retirement. And so Bill does a great job of this and comes at it from a Christian perspective. You can find out more about him at williamhroberts.com and you can find a link to him in my show notes. And finally, for those of you who don't know, you can get a free resource from my website, andymillerthird.com. That's Andy Miller III. It's called Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. It's a 45-minute mini course that has an eight-page document that's available for folks. And I would love for you to sign up for that. So if you sign up for my email list, you will get this free resource that's available for you. All right, on to today's program. I am so glad to welcome in Dr. Tim Larson, who serves as a McManus professor of Christian thought. Some of you might even recognize that it is because it's connected. To, uh, he followed Mark Knoll into that position. So, Tim, I am so honored to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, I obviously have an interest in this, this area because I serve, have served in a six generations into the Salvation Army. Um, mm. But the, the denominations that are connected to our seminary, Wesley Biblical Seminary, generally have their origins in the same place. So I've just been fascinated by your research and I've come upon it lately uh, in more depth. So what, what is it that got you interested in studying Victorian Christianity? Yes. Well, some of it was my PhD mentor, David Bevington. He, wow. uh, you know, evangelicalism, in modern Britain, he's, he defined what evangelicalism means uh, for uh, even organizations that are 150 years old that have the word evangelical in their title, use his definition. So it's like, well, obviously you knew what evangelical meant beforehand because you already called yourself that, but <laughs> he, he clarified it. Uh, so I went to study with him and, and he really focused on the 19th century. But I came quickly to see that uh, almost every issue that confronts the church in our time, the Victorians had to kind of do the first version of figuring out something and addressing that. And so it's a, I always see history as a great way to kind of refract a conversation. You're not like in the fight in your denomination in real time. You're just thinking <laughs> with people who are now dead about how do I think more clearly and more faithfully about this issue. And that, the Victorians helped me with that enormously. And, and like you said, like many of the issues that we're dealing with now, we can find precedent for that uh, in the 19th century. Like it's uh, from revelation to dealing with science to I mean, any number of issues. Now, it's interesting that you study with David Bebbington. Uh, I'm sure there's many people who would think uh, it, when he defined uh, evangelicalism at the beginning of his book, um, the famous book, that it was a. Uh, I don't think he would have thought the, the word quadrilateral would be so connected to his name, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a funny thing because he was just trying to show the scope of the book that he was doing, you know? So it was like, that was like, just like an initial, like, what it, what is the context of this actual study I'm doing? And yet it became so famous. It was just like, it met a need that was so much bigger than the need for defining his book. And it really caught on. Oh yeah. he. It just seems like... It, like you said, I mean, they'll probably be, there's denominations that use it. It's just a nice, quick way to handle things. But he was trying to define a period, like he's going from 1740 on, like to say, this is what evangelicalism is. So I, I think it's, and boy, it's great that you got a chance to study with him. It makes sense for uh, considering the type of things you're writing on. Particularly, like you've also focused on nonconformist traditions, which is where I find him to be so helpful. 
Um, okay, let me get in. One of the big movements that you make in your scholarly works is this move away from what's often identified as a secularization thesis. Uh, so tell me, what is that thesis and why does it need to be challenged? Yeah, thank you. So the secularization thesis was a sociological view, primarily, at least in, originally, it got you know transported to other, other disciplines that modernity, the modern condition inevitably leads to secularization defined as the decreased social significance of religion and really with a kind of implication that if religion doesn't die out, it will be kind of like a really kind of marginal fringe, unimportant thing. That, that, that the future is not religious. The future does not wow. have faith. And that was supposedly a, almost like a kind of law of you know, the, the unfolding of modern reality. Um, there are many ironies about it. One of them is that so secularization theory is actually older than secularization. So, mm. so, so people now um, see the trends that are often used to, to talk about this as starting in the 1960s. Uh, but sociologists were talking about it already in the 19th century. Um, and so when it turns out that maybe the highest church attendance that ever happened in all of the church's history happened in the 19th century. And nevertheless, yeah. people were imagining. So there are many, many things to unpack uh, with that. I'll let you uh, kind of probe what you want. But one of them, is, you know, is, you know, what evidence counts? What is it evidence for? And then this assumption of inevitability about this process as well. Right. And it, do you think is, is it kind of connected to like a, a talking point of sorts, like with Darwin or... Um, Dover Beach, yeah. Matthew Arnold, these type of things like that are a popular move away from traditional Christian thought. Um, is is that why scholars just kind of easily lump things together to fit into the sociological paradigm? Yes, so many things get get um, muddled up and confused. So people were really attracted to it because of their own often um, loss of faith or kind of becoming less connected to the church or Christian thought than their parents or their grandparents. And so they made that kind of into a law of the universe, what had happened to them. Uh, but it turns out, even from a sociological perspective, if you look at what's going on, it's not intellectual. So that whole thing is a red herring. It okay. isn't this idea that somehow people learn something and couldn't believe anymore. Um, there are things that are changing, but that's not what's driving them. Interesting. And it's not like the process of uh, the development of of educational systems in England, like like a lot of times, like people, say, oh, okay, so like now they know, now they have these systems yeah. in place, so they're so it's that's not what it's it definitely, is. Definitely not that. So uh, you, uh, uh, there's a couple of books we could highlight that you've written. One is a, a Crisis of Faith, where you talk about people who went the opposite directions that you described, right? They they didn't they actually. They were famous atheists who became Christians in the 19th century, but I. I was drawn to people of one book mm -hmm. and this was a fascinating book to me in part because I, my own interest in Methodist and holiness studies, because you have a chapter talking about Catherine Booth and William Cook. But what struck me about the rest of the book as a whole was that you were just highlighting the role that scripture played in the 19th century, not just in these Christian writers, but in, and all layers of society from atheists to agnostics and the like. So what I'm, I'm curious, what led you to this? Was it just like after studying Victorians, um, being Victorian studies so long that you realize nobody has written on this? I mean, this is a, this is a really fascinating book. Yeah, it is a strange thing. Cause it, I mean, in one sense, you know, you're describing water to fish, you know, it's like the, the Bible is so important to Victorian culture. It's hard to find a way to overestimate it. And yet for, for some reason, scholars, don't talk about it, um, and even kind of say the opposite. They love to imagine that people are somehow breaking away from scripture or uh, subverting scripture. That's all, when, when literary scholars talk about it, that's almost all they talk about is somebody they imagine is subverting scripture. And for me, it's like they are actually thinking through scripture. They, they, they yeah. cannot come up with their own ideas uh, without using the resources of scripture. So, so someone like, um, a T.H. Huxley, who invented right. the word agnostic, right. who is like the most famous unbeliever. He was called Darwin's bulldog. Right. Sense, you know, and he, um, you know, is 
put in that kind of polemical category of somebody who's attacking the faith. And yet, if you look at all of his writings, they are steeped in scripture. If you look at his critiques of other ideas, he uses the category of idolatry. And that is not even superficial. He will say flat out, the Old Testament prophets, to me, explain what is true and what is real. Mm. And so when they condemn idolatry, he buys that as the central way to expose what is false. And he's mm. using that in scientific ideas. He's using it in philosophical ideas. Um, so and then he's just one example. But yeah, people well, are- Let's stop on Huxley for a second. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm fascinated by him because in my tradition, the Salvation Army, he was the chief enemy. Yeah. <laughs> and he went after William Booth uh, in the Times with a oh. series of articles. I'm sh- sure you're aware of it. Oh, after, in 1890, after William Booth developed uh, the social scheme and in Darkest England and Way Out, his book, and Catherine had just died. Nevertheless, Huxley came after him hard and invented words that are in the dictionary today, like Corey Bantic Christianity is what he called the Salvation Army. And so he had a book where he identified the Salvation of, of these articles and he had an introduction to it. Um, it's called uh, something about diseases, uh, social diseases and their um, their cures or something. OK, so I've, I finally found a copy of this book. Yeah. With, um, Ryland's library. I'm sure yeah. you've been there. Yes, and I so, have. So I, when I was there. I got the guy look and, and honestly reading it, I was expecting to come in touch with somebody who is like a Richard Dawkins mm-hmm. because the, the army's literature is like, this guy is just mean, terrible, awful. Yeah. Well, I was surprised. You could have thought that this was written by um, maybe kind of just a liberal Christian. Yeah. The nature of his critique almost came like, this is good. This the Salvation Army, in his view, wasn't good for religion. Like he had a concern for yeah. the Church of England. I, I was so surprised. Yeah. So it, it, uh, yeah, I'll just jump in if you want. Um, so, yep. you know, he it's hard for people to get back to it, because, but, but he was a critic and he was a critic on the assumption that Christianity would hold, that the center would hold, that, that the life of faith would go on. You know, his wife goes to church, his children go to church, you know, and so you kind of feel free to like say, I want to try to like, you know, puncture some bad thinking, some hypocrisy, whatever it is, but you don't imagine it all going away. You're trying to purify it, really. And so mm. he he's a critic, but he's a critic within a context in which Christianity is so central that he cannot conceive of it actually being taken down or being lost. He's trying to make it better in his own way. Yeah. Exactly. That's a, that 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 says it so much better than what I was saying. It, it, it's interesting too. Like you highlight in your chapter that he supported uh, keeping the Bible Bible education in schools. He not only supports it, he he votes for a resolution that has what schools teach as the first item as the Bible. A reading, <laughs> writing, and arithmetic come after the Bible. It's like as the number one goal of public education. Um, yeah, it's extraordinary, and he totally believed that. And wow. he, yeah, he quotes the Bible in a way that I don't mean to um, criticize anybody else, but I think a lot of ministers couldn't do today. You know, he, the, the depth of his knowledge of scripture is so deep. But again, that's not making him some strange person. That's making him a Victorian, where that was the most important cultural resource in the entire society. And so this, again, this moves against that idea that society is moving it away f- entirely from religion but you're you're suggesting this this was just the air that they breathed like the, the bible scripture faith absolutely and and also you know i think people are very confused about doubt doubt is only makes sense if there's an assumption of faith uh doubt by its very existence wow yeah um is the shadow of faith um you know there's unbelief you could have unbelief and not have faith. But doubt automatically says, I am responding to faith. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what doubt means, you know? Um, so- They're doubting something. Yeah, yeah. something that, that, that that's there, and, you know, and is kind of like, it's, it's big enough, it's important enough that it needs um, to be thought through. So, you know, uh, if you absolutely know something's not true, you don't doubt it, you just don't believe it. Um, so, so whenever so scholars all the time like, oh, look, they're talking about doubt. It shows that there isn't faith. And for me, it says there's faith everywhere. Wow. You're always encountering faith. 
That's what doubt means. Mm. So, so you have this it, it, in Huxley, you have the person who created the word agnostic, right? Yeah. Who, who th- this, and, and, but you also highlight atheists um, and, and people from other traditions and like this common, co- what, for instance, like you, you talk about um, the Anglo-Catholic tradition and, and maybe as people are getting into, you're thinking about Victorian studies in general, uh, t- tell us about that tradition. What, what is it that people often don't get about what was going on with Pusey and Newman and the, that tradition? So what, what, what people tend to focus on, not um, wrongly, because that's what is new and different, is their emphasis on apostolic succession, on church tradition, on things that pull the Church of England closer to Roman Catholicism in certain ways, on liturgy, on ritual. And all of that is there. But what they never focus on is their deep obsession and commitment to scripture because that didn't distinguish them from other Christians. And what you yeah. kind of focus on is what distinguishes where I mean, a part of what, you know, uh, and there's a, uh, a C.S. Lewis quote where he talks about that, where if you if you look at people from the 17th century, what we notice is how much they have in common. What they noticed was how much they had there was there was different. You know, they focus on yeah. what they disagree on. But we're like, oh, you're all assuming this, you know, and we don't assume that anymore. And so I see you know, the commonalities. So Pusey is the leader of the Tractarians, especially after Newman um, becomes a Catholic, a Roman Catholic. Right. And so, you know, people called them Pusyites. You know, and his okay. name became a, a synonym for the entire movement. And yet he spends his entire life writing commentaries on scripture. And he sees it as not like just his vocation or what he's good at. He sees it as the response to all of the modern challenges of society. If people could hear scripture, they could respond correctly to the things that are facing society today. And he actually is recruiting all of his friends who are Anglo-Catholics saying, you know, what you should give your life to is writing commentaries on scripture. And then we could solve the problems that you're worried about and the things that are facing us. Wow. Yeah. I, I, that whole movement, there is a, and I'm just, just in the literature at the moment, um, it, people are regularly responding to that movement. And, and, and it's interesting to think like you highlight that they see it as in this almost a liturgical way, the Holy scriptures, like this yeah. is how they want to yeah. highlight it. Like, um, let me ask you. Well, to, let me just like, say uh, one more thing on uh, that. Go uh, ahead. The opposite is like the most low church dissenting, evangelicals admired Pusey's commentaries often. You know, mm. someone like Charles Spurgeon will say, I disagree with him on all kinds of things, but his commentary on Daniel is great. <laughs> he really gets what's going on in scripture. And so it is, it becomes this bridge where people can find each other. You know, you know what, t- t- speaking of Spurgeon, so you, yeah. you have a chapter on him as well and talking about him um, in this dissenting tradition, like fr- from the more, orthodox view so t- tell talk us a little about what spurgeon's view was and like how that highlighted the book from him yeah so um you know dissenters are those protestants who don't accept the established church or cannot at least join the, the current version of the, of the established church uh, you have an established church in scotland and you have one in england and so it's a whole group of protestants and for spurgeon Um, he just had such a strong, clear conviction of the power of Scripture. He really, really thought um, Scripture is the power unto salvation. And so he wanted to preach a sermon that was scriptural, that got Scripture into people's hearts and minds. He had a strong faith that, that, that communicating the words of Scripture would be the mechanism for the Holy Spirit to bring about salvation. He really thought that that was the way to steady your own life. He had kind of great visions for like, if you would just read a short text in the middle of the day, you know, you, you would be kind of realigning your, your, you're in the middle of your business day and maybe you're like getting into s- disputes or temptations or whatever it is. And you're just going to read, maybe it's just literally one text that's been selected to kind of just get your heart back aligned with scripture again. Uh, in his um, summer home, he literally had um, scripture as the wallpaper. So he's like literally wow. looking at all four walls. He's reading scripture. And mm-hmm. um, you you kind of get a sense that you could do many other examples like that. But the sense of the power of scripture was deep, deep in his life and ministry. 
seems like the it, it's hard to tr track it all in reading the literature, but the same is true with reading the standard sermons of John Wesley is that it's just flows from what they're saying. It's like, it's, it's their vocabulary when they, they pick up biblical images. So for instance, if you look at Albert Outler's um, uh, edited volumes of the standard sermons of John Wesley, the footnotes, he tries to pick up on as many of those allusions as he can. It's just filled with it. And the same thing would be true with Spurgeon. It's just, that's the way that they talk. And, 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 and I think it's the, it, Furthers this idea that you have that this was a group that was moved, like the culture is moving yeah. away from faith instead. Like this was their culture. It's what everybody knew. It is the most um, shareable cultural resource for everyone. I don't care what your personal opinions are. I don't care if you're lower class or aristocratic, wherever you fit into society, whatever your um, moral choices have been. Scripture is known better than anything else, anything else. Um, and, and, and also, I think we, we live in a culture now where there's very little memorization because we it's so easy to access uh, words and text, uh, just searchable on computers and phones. And there's something about when you've memorized a text that these words spontaneously come to you in situations where you're seeing something and it's rhyming with something in scripture and you're hearing in your head a passage of scripture that is your response to whatever's going on in front of you or whatever you're thinking about. Yeah. It's, it's true today, but not as much as it was in Victorian times. Like we could still see traces of that in our culture where people maybe don't know it. They're like kind of haunted by God, but there's, it was a different context for Victorian Christianity. I'm interested too in your chapter. Obviously, I, I think people who know me be interested in, in William Booth or, or Catherine Booth and William Cook, yeah, and representing the holiness tradition. Yeah, you helped me, and I've I've been suggesting for a long time that William Booth and Catherine Booth owe more to William Cook than is noted, and I'll say in general the Methodist New Connection. So one of the problems with William Booth studies is that many of the first commentators or biographers acted like as if he was allergic to theology. They would, uh, Begbie, Harold Begbie, who was the first yeah. official biographer said he's plagued by theology. And so the, I, they, they would uh, put together stories that would characterize Coke as if this strange academic who couldn't deal with the restless booth. And th there's probably some of that's true, but it misses the influence that he has. And I was so glad to see you pick up on this. And I'll just tell one story and I'll let you talk about no, it. No, I want to hear your story. Okay. Uh, I went to the archives this summer. I was at the International Heritage Center and of the Salvation Army. And in the, the collection of books they had from the Booth family, there's Bramwell Booth's copy of William Coke's Systematic Theology, 700 pages. Yeah. And what was fascinating was how much Bramwell Booth had annotated that book. Yeah. He tore apart every page. Yeah. It felt like he was just, and he was well aware, particularly when it got to issues of the sacraments. But anyways, it's just a major influence on the Booths, but also a, a major uh, character person in mm. this tradition. So tell, tell me a little bit about William Coke and, and his kind of emphasis in scripture. Yeah, so he, um, I think of him as one of the kind of top handful of great Methodist theologians of the 19th century. So, you know, he kind of transcends the Methodist New Connection, although he is certainly a, um, you know, a true son of the Methodist New Connection. You know, he, he totally believes their distinctives, but other Methodists, even Wesleyan Methodists, totally recognize him as a gift to the body of Christ, as a great, clear theological thinker, um, and I, I'll say, you know, frankly, you know, I've done professional theological degrees. I teach theology. And yet I really found it helpful to read through his Christian theology. Okay. I, I, I thought he just had some great clear arguments. He had, a, he had a kind of mind for like following in a way that was the straight line that people could grasp very clearly. This is why this matters. This is why this is not just some esoteric little conversation that professional theologians have because they have too much free time. But it's about what matters in terms of the gospel and of revelation and of scripture's teaching. 
So he's a great theologian uh, of his day, of his movement. Uh, and I think we, we, what you were saying earlier, I think there's a confusion there because I think uh, Catherine and William Booth are deeply in debt to Cook. Um, but their, the, what their own innovation is about um, structure and flexibility and adaptability in ministry and ministry forms. It's not about the kind of theological deposit it's about right. the, the, the effective delivery of those things. Um, and that doesn't make them merely pragmatists or popularizers. They're also uh, theologians uh, and intellectuals, but their frustration with denominations is not primarily about the kind of things that William Cook gave his life to, clarifying mm -hmm. you know, why these doctrines matter, what scripture is, uh, who God is, um, the atonement. Uh, they're, they're learning from him and imbibing that but then they're asking, well, how can we make these resources available to the masses? And right. we need structures uh, that are going to be flexible enough to meet the reality of the need out there and not get tied down in rules and bureaucracy and kind of bottlenecks in doing that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, it's, uh, Cook seems to be in this position where and, and if you read, what he is said, and I was able to ch check out some of the minutes from the New Connection, uh, minutes of the New Connection annual meetings and these type of things. He's very endearing toward the booths. Like, mm. and, and he recognizes, he, he kind of releases William Booth, yeah. asks him to become the Duke district superintendent of London at a young age, and then even tries to save him for the connection, like tries to create an office so that there would be an avenue for booth to be present so uh, now nevertheless Catherine does have some hard words for him at other points but there still is some interesting like insight that he recognized the booths have a uh, a form that's different and maybe they can take his theology and take it out and i i think that's what happened yeah yeah i mean another person in um the book is josephine butler yes who, yes yes uh who you know really um opposed some very um, sexist and offensive um, double standard laws about, um, um, you know, what, what would happen was women would be inspected to see if they had viral diseases, but not men. Um, and so, and she actually uses the word double standard. It's fascinating. Uh, so she was a big advocate for women who, who were both caught up in the sex trade and women who were falsely accused of it. Uh, but she's an, uh, an Anglican, she's Church of England, Nevertheless, she thinks of Catherine Booth as one of the greatest Christian figures of the century. And, mm. and I think many, many people who were a long way from Catherine and William Booth in their own denominational identity or theological convictions, nevertheless saw, here is a great Christian. Here's, a, here's, mm. here's somebody who belongs to everybody who claims Christ and cares about the faith should recognize um, the level of the deposit that is in them. Mm. Well, it, even somebody like I know that like David Bevington's done a fair amount of work on Hugh Price Hughes um, yeah. like this. He he lit. I found this place where he listed like the leaders of church history and he puts William Booth right up on the list. So he's like a peer, a peer yeah. of his, basically. So I've, if, and same thing with Catherine. And I think Catherine more so because of women in ministry. Now, you take an interesting slant. You say that both Cook and Catherine Booth are biblicists and mm -hmm. kind of step outside of the. Uh, kind of tradition uh, in systematic theology of having like a doctrine of God first, but, yeah. and, and it's still to this day, I think it's a good, I think it's a good critique, by the way, uh, it's still to this day, the Salvation Army's first article of faith is one on scripture. Yeah. So, so what do you mean by biblicist? Yeah, well, I, I'll just pick up on that specific point that you're making. Um, I, I was kind of saying, it's kind of funny to start with a doctrine of scripture uh, as, as a logical, you know, uh, order in one way, because the Bible is meaningful because it's inspired by God. So you have to kind of like, you have to start with God to make the Bible uh, have any kind of special identity. Uh, so the traditionally theology starts with God and then the Bible finds its uh, significance in the fact that God inspired it. Uh, but it does make sense in a kind of methodological ordering because if you start with scripture, then you know what your authority is for establishing all the other doctrines. And so then when you talk about God, you already have in place, I can use scripture as the authoritative way to explain what statements about God are true or not true, are appropriate or not pro appropriate. So it makes methodological sense, but it is kind of funny in a logical sense. Yeah, I thought I thought it was a good point. And I think it's helpful to, to see 
that that's where they are coming from. And, and also the connection that, that, that was something that the booths and the, you know, er, the early uh, Christian mission or East London Christian revival association or any of the dozen names that they had at the start was mirroring the doctrines of the new connection. Like they, they didn't, didn't even try to distinguish themselves too much from it. It's like a pr copy and paste. If there's such a thing at a time, that's what they did. Okay. The other uh, one more on that book I wanted to highlight is I thought it was interesting that you bring up the Unitarians and, and we rightly like, cause of Unitarian universalism and, and probably the far out way that that movement exists now compared to, I'll just say mainstream Christianity. Don't think of it as very connected to scripture, but <laughs> maybe it's just like kind of a modern bias, but you talk about Mary Carpenter and her, her emphasis on um, scripture. Uh, I forget the exact way that you, every chapter you have a way that they highlight what scripture was. I forget yeah. what it was in that one, but there, there's, it still was so prominent. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Th there's a, you know, it, the Unitarians today don't want to see their own uh, tradition, how biblicist it was earlier on. So this gets kind of, <laughs> you know, retold and, and rewritten. And I, I've been frustrated with how many scholars have kind of imagined Unitarianism to be what they want it to be rather than what it actually was at the time. Um, so yeah, her, her father was the, a leading um, Unitarian theologian. And one of his main works uh, was a harmony of the Synoptic Gospels. <laughs> he was so committed to like the literal uh, uh, without error truth of scripture that every little discrepancy of like, you know, were there two blind men or one blind man? Did it, you know, did it happen when he came into the city or came out of the city where like all that mattered to him? It had to be you know, <laughs> gotten right. Uh, that's not how people think of Unitarians uh, at all. And it is, again, another manifestation of the fact that, that these people know the scriptures so deeply, whatever their personal opinions are, this text is inside them in such a careful, minute way that all of these sentences and claims matter. Uh, yes. And that shows up, you know, over and over again in, in the book. Yeah. yeah, it's, that's interesting. I want to transition now to talk about um, a, a series that you've edited, the Oxford History of Protestant Dissenting Traditions. Now that's a mouthful, but it's five volumes. Yes. And I, and, and you edited yourself the third volume dealing with the 19th century. But there's something I think it's helpful to is well, it was helpful to me to read your introduction to and, you know, each of the 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 introduction to, that's in yeah, front of all series. of them. Yep. Yeah, the series. Thank you for helping me. The um uh unpacking the title because this a lot like we're we're in a time now, like just recently, just this week, we've had the Queen's funeral. There's mm -hmm. this move this the, the influence of British culture is a big part of Western Christianity and as you highlight too, global Christianity. So I'm interested in even like getting to the idea of what dissenting traditions are. So even just let's talk about that title a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, the, the basic distinction is between whether or not you are an established church, that the, that the state is sponsoring you and backing you up. So in England, that is the Church of England. And uh, as you mentioned, we've seen that in the Queen's funeral. And I lived in England for 10 years uh, in the 90s. And it would always surprise me as an American, uh, the ways in which that establishment actually is different uh, mm. from how. So, for example, it's in law that you would have to have um, an act of worship in the public schools that is quote, mostly Christian. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, it was, you know, it was like, here's like the state coming in and saying, we're gonna do something. Uh, you would hear on the radio stations, you would have like a, all of a sudden you would have a Christian minister come on and give a little five minute reflection um, because the state was requiring them to do this. Nevertheless, um, a whole range of Christians found that they could not agree with all of the theological claims or ecclesial claims of the Church of England and therefore broke away or kicked out. And so they stand for those um, distinctives or whatever they are that they don't believe in bishops, for example, would be one common example. 
Um, but over time, especially, they came to see the idea of the state enforcing Christianity as against what Christ called for, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, and therefore how the church is strong and how it thrives is not through the coercion of the state, it's through the power of the gospel. And so objecting to state churches became a, ma a theological principle uh, for many of them, but it also was about freedom of worship. Yeah, so, so a dissenting tradition, you know, it, it, based upon the way you define it, um, many of the movements that would uh, denominations or even groups that wouldn't even would say that they're not a denomination find their origins in this dissenting church. Like, or, or let me ask it this way, I guess, is make it a question. Who, who are dissenters? Yeah. Now, so, it, yeah. So it, it really gets going in, um, in the 17th century. Uh, so uh, Presbyterians are an interesting example because uh, in some ways they want to be the state church and they actually become the state church in Scotland, uh, right. but not in England. So they become dissenters, um, not in a principle against established churches, but they're just not established. They have a different view of church polity. Uh, but Baptists and Congregationalists, uh, Congregationalists are kind of in the middle. They, they, they come, become clear that they don't believe in state churches, but they flirt with it more, uh, especially in America. Massachusetts actually has a Congregational state church for a while before uh, the United States. Um, and Baptists never want it. Um, and then Quakers in the 17th century. And then of course, uh, in the conversation that we're having uh, a lot of the time here in the 18th century, the Methodist movement happens. And what's fascinating about Methodism is it very quickly becomes the largest of all of the churches uh, outside of the established church. And so even though it's called New Descent, uh, they're, the, they're the new kid on the block. They're also the biggest kid on the block. Uh, very quickly, even in the United States, Methodism becomes the biggest denomination. Uh, in England, Church of England, and then uh, Wesleyan Methodism, Primitive Methodism, you have even like, you know, um, um, other versions of Methodism become That's like nice. larger than, than these historic ones from the 17th century, like, like Baptists. Um, so that becomes, and then what's interesting about the Methodists, of course, is that they uh, were kicked out. So they take some while to figure out what is their own view of a state church because they, they weren't against it uh, when they were obviously in it. Uh, but as they be, are out of it for longer, they start to see some of the weaknesses of the state church model. And, and it's all of this then makes its way, as you say, kind of in that introduction, out of England. So many, it's like, it's like almost an out of England movement. And, and, and this is global Christianity too. Not that, there, and I don't want to, say this in a way that disrespects or dishonors those uh, ways that the church got to places sooner. Like the way that the church arrived in like um, via the, you know, Catholic groups that came ahead of, you know, uh, yeah. 19th century missionaries to China or whatever. Yeah. I mean, like I recognize there, there's ways, but the kind of the Protestant missionary movement is, is, it, is am I correct to say out of England? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, so these traditions, uh, but it's also the out, like is really out. So, you yeah. know, you say, you know, what's a major Methodist um, country? Fiji. Right. What's, a, what's a major Presbyterian country? South Korea. You know, what's a major Pentecostal country? Argentina. You know, so, so it's like, you know, like these things take on a life of their own and the biggest um, you know, far larger populations of them are, are, are in many other parts of the world than they are in England. I mean, Methodism is not doing great in England today, frankly, uh, right. you know, but, but it's doing better in other parts of the world. Um, and so, but yes, and, and part of, you know, what happened in the 17th century was that the dissenters were too big for the state to think that it could suppress them. It had to tolerate them. And so religious toleration comes out of England but it's kind of an accident of this reality that there are strong enough, large enough and important enough denominations that are not gonna join the state church that you have to find a new way of thinking about how to coexist together as a state with a plurality of different denominations in it. Yes, it, it, and that's the breakup of what had been Christian history is that there had been uh, established religious traditions that they, they couldn't even imagine not being connected to the state. 
Am I correct to say that? Yeah, no, it's, you have uh, up until the 17th century, that is, you know, the assumption is just not whether the state will sponsor a particular religion, but which one will they sponsor? That's the only mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. uh, so to imagine, maybe we don't even um, build, we build a whole different model. That's not the model of a state church is a really big new thought that's coming in. And this, again, it, it, it's, uh, it's the dominant one now. And yet part of what I want to emphasize, which loops back to your earlier thing is that this is not secularization. This is not the church getting forced out of the state because, um, Christianity is dying. This is deeply committed Christians rethinking their theology of church state relations and saying mm -hmm. this needs to change, not because Christianity isn't strong, but because we have misunderstood what the gospel teaches about how best to propagate the gospel. Yes. This comes in my own uh, research and interest is trying to get to a place of understanding how William Booth in the 1880s and how the Salvation Army could abandon the traditional Protestant sacraments. Like this is yeah. just like what is going on historically, ecclesiologically to get to the place where that could happen. And so I've spent time trying to, I, it's the never ending dive, yeah. honestly. And so I, at the, I was at Lambeth Palace Library this summer and looking at communication between William Booth and various archbishops of Canterbury. Mm. And I was amazed at the way that William Booth held such high respect for the archbishop. I mean, he called them all of the proper titles. I'm not typical American. I can't, your grace, all these yeah, yeah. things. Yeah. And like, yeah. incredibly respectful. I mean, almost yeah. just like, here I come bowing before you before I even... Yeah say what I'm going to say in this letter. Just make sure you know, I know. My, but there was part of it was like why he couldn't. And, and, he, and this is the same thing is true for all of the various Methodist denominations. They didn't think of themselves as a church. Why? Because there was the church. The church was the Church of England. And they're trying to fight yeah. through this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think for me, I, I, I you know much more about this than I do. But um, the sacraments are a very strong locus of division. So if you're trying to create a unified Christian movement, I think that the, in Booth's mind, it was, we're gonna do this thing that's collaborative. And therefore we're gonna bracket this thing uh, that is how people distinguish themselves as different versions of Christianity. Um, and yeah, I think that you're right that he is seeing, you know, I, I guess if I say it the other way around, you know, many, many, Anglicans of all kinds of theological stripes fantasized about wouldn't it be great for the Church of England if we can get the Salvation Army in the house? Yes. You know, like this yes, is like yes, an yes. amazing movement. These are amazing Christians who are reaching people, they're connecting with the working class. And so could this not be a, like an order, like you know, like, yes. like the Catholics, you know, have you know, Dominicans and Franciscans and Jesuits? Couldn't we have the Salvation Army in the house as an order uh, that is represents something distinctive, but yet in a larger unity. Yes, that's what was going. And that, that's the, the correspondence I was reading about. And eventually it just broke down. I think William Booth was not willing to give up his throne. <laughs> yeah. And I, like I said, you know, I, I mean, you know, I don't want to um, dismiss possibilities that some of those are, are autocratic weaknesses on his side. Um, but, you know, he was I mean, it's the same exact same thing to me as John Wesley. John Wesley. Yes. You know, he wasn't um, trying to defy people for its own sake, but he always chose what he thought was effective transmission of the gospel over those in-house systems. And if he was convinced, well, you might say it's against canon law to preach outdoors, but if people are coming to Christ, we're going to do it. You know, and right. and and so I think that, that Booth, would, you know, he would hit that. And I, I think he'd like to be in charge, and I get that, and I, I don't dispute that, but he also like to say if there could be a rapid response that was effective to do this and you're going to clog it up in committees for seven years we're not going right. to let it happen that's right and, and it's it's easy to to just uh mischaracterize him as just a pure autocrat and, and like you're right there is autocratic tendencies in there but there's a theological motivation for doing that and it's connected to the fact that he thought that everybody in the world should be saved. Yes, <laughs> like he wanted exactly. everybody because it, so sue, so sue him, you know, like yes. I, I'm, I'm sympathetic. <laughs> so 
the, the John Wesley piece is interesting too because that, that's what happens. Um, this will, and it, this is, I think, what starts Methodism down this pike. I might not be here today if John Wesley wouldn't have decided in 1784 to ordain Thomas Cope. And yes. then by then, and then Francis Asbury makes his way to the United States. And this leads to a place where evangelical Methodism breaks away and that becomes a part of our tradition. So I'm, I pr appreciate you highlighting that, that, that those are connected. You want to say anything more about that, that period in the Methodist side? I don't have a good question, but I just want to let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think just, um, you know, it's easy to forget like just the beauty of ordinary people hearing the gospel, knowing that it's addressed to them, knowing that even though a society might think of them as poor and insignificant and marginal, that the gospel is about their dignity as a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I see that in Wesley a lot. I think people, it's hard to get back to it, that, you know, it, at the time, uh, churches were funded by pew rents. My you God. literally sat based on your social station. The, the, the wealthiest, most respectable, oldest families sat in the front and you kind of, sat in order of where you fit into society. And if you were very poor, maybe you stood in the back or maybe you were in the balcony. Um, and so for Wesley to just say, let's be outdoors where there's none of that. Yes. And it's not going to be a sermon about how you need to do your duty to your betters, which was a very common 18th century sermon. It's going to be a, a sermon that that realizes that the drama of salvation in your soul is the highest individual drama there is. And mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is coming for you. And it's not about whether you're rich or poor. It's not about whether uh, you have great clothes or where you're going to fit into this structure. Um, you know, and so I, I, I think people, you know, again, we tend to focus on differences as, as historians, like what, you know, what do we think about, you know, Christian perfectionism or whatever? This is what Wesley's right, all about. Right. Wesley's all about ordinary people hearing the gospel and being transformed by it. That's what he's really about. Amen. And, and it's this movement then that leads, why, why I think it's significant, like when you guys highlighting in this series, this history, yeah. is this is connected to a majority of, of Protestantism right now. Like if you look at Wesley being connected to the holiness movement, the holiness movement being connected to Pentecostalism. Yes. This is this is it. Yeah. And what you just said, somebody might take it for granted that uh, Wesley's commitment to the ordinary work of, of proclaiming the gospel and that transforming an ordinary person's life, that might not have been said <laughs> before. Uh, I mean, uh, now some people would say, of course, there are some people, Wesley has his own influences, but that wasn't the common experience. Is that right? Absolutely right. It's it's almost, it's worse than that in some ways. Um, <laughs> You know, um, what, what had happened was because in the 17th century, there had been so many um, wars, civil wars, wars on the continent, the English Civil War, and, and religion had been a factor in that. Mm -hmm. That when you get into the early 18th century, there's almost a desire to dampen down people's religious fervor, their zeal, because mm -hmm. of a fear that it can erupt and create violence. And so you almost like, not only are people not preaching to awaken people's souls and have them have their lives fully alive to Christ, they're almost like trying to put them to sleep. You know, it's like, just don't yeah. think about it too much. Just do your duty, calm down. And so for Whitfield and Wesley and uh, the Countess of Huntington and others, like to, to, to make the focus what is going on in your own heart and mind and life? Are you being transformed by Christ? I don't, I'm not, it's not enough to say, do, will you assent to these doctrines? Mm -hmm. um, will you, you know, refrain from doing these gross sins? But do you know Jesus Christ? That is the question, yes. you know, and it's, it's, it's transformative and it's different and it's powerful in that time. Uh, and I'm thankful for all of that we can pick up on. And, and, and there's even a, a response to this that comes in the 19th century with the Anglo-Catholic movement with yeah. Newman and the like. So like, okay, we, we have this privatized faith and, and that can be criticized pretty easily. People and people in our time are critical of it. And this might even move people in our time back to more liturgical traditions or, or the yeah. Orthodox movements. 
but still like what you just said is so important. Is there something that is happening in your life? Like, have you come into in touch with Jesus? Yeah. Like the, the resurrected Jesus, Jesus is on the throne and is available for you now. Like that's what this tradition does and why it's so significant. I think even for, for our time, like the challenges we face with revelation, human sexuality, and like it does, there is this point of having to come to a place where we realize that Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. I agree completely. Amen. Well, this has been such a, a, a helpful, fun conversation for me. Now, you also have a book, too, that's come out, The Oxford Handbook on Christmas. And of anybody uh, who needs to be thinking about Christmas, they're already, when people are listening to this, Salvation Army people are already well under the way with their plans for Christmas. Yeah, man, so, yes. So they are ready to go. So tell us about this book. And uh, did this stem from your work already in Victorian studies? It did. Um, yeah, it's a strange uh, thing. Uh, I'm a historian in a theology department. I'm very interdisciplinary. I actually wrote a, a book about um, social anthropology as well. And the 19th century, the Victorian period, is such a turning point for Christmas traditions. Most of what we think about as celebrating Christmas is refracted through Dickens and the Victorians. So it kind of, I realized it was just like it put a lot of things together. It, it, it took somebody like me who kind of was um, not very drilled down in one specific discipline to say, I'm going to talk about Christmas in all of its form. I'm going to have, you know, film studies. People talk about Christmas films. I'm going to have uh, sociologists and anthropologists. You know, I'm going to have people in food studies talk about Christmas food, but I'm going to have <laughs> theologians and, and biblical scholars. And uh, so I could put that team together and enjoy it. But then at the heart of it, I could put the Victorian studies that I know and I could do a chapter that is um, central to that conversation, but I could uh, bring in my expertise. And there was, and I also just love Christmas and I grew up loving it. My father uh, just taught me to love it. And so it was um, in times when uh, so many things uh, uh, were wearying and depressing in pandemics and politics and everything else, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to think about Christmas a lot of my time? And, that, and it was a good way to live. But, so what are some of the things that people uh, don't understand about Christmas. Yeah, historically. Yeah, there are so many. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go for go go for one that that, that not every um, but he's gonna want to hear. But but uh oh, I, I think it's like, uh -oh. Uh, burst a bubble. Yeah, um, Santa Claus is a deeply Christian tradition. Uh -oh. uh, if you look at all of the early people who um, give the kind of like. Um, definition of how we think about Santa Claus, they're all um, deeply committed, committed Christians. Um, so uh, um, Samuel Clark Moore, who does Puss the Night Before Christmas, which is really how we think about Santa Claus with, you know, uh, the flying and coming down chimneys and stuff. He was a professor of Old Testament at a seminary. Um, oh, interesting. His father <laughs> was a bishop. Um, um, uh, Frank Church, who wrote, uh, Yes, Virginia, There is a Santa Claus, uh, was actually uh, a very devout Christian man. He was the religion editor for the Sun newspaper in New York. Uh, when he dies, they don't mention at all that he wrote, yes, Virginia, there's a Santa Claus. Uh, but they just do, a minister just talks about what a godly man he was, what a great Christian faith that he had. Um, and you see this over and over again. And obviously, um, so I'll tell you, uh, um, you know, in the 19th century, if you wanted to get a Santa outfit, you had to order it from a Christian supply store. It was, the, it was like a Sunday school supplier. It was the only place you can get a Santa out. Interesting. Because, wow. It, you know, and, and that's how people met Santa Claus was not in a department store, but in Sunday school. Um, and then uh, the Salvation Army becomes uh, very, very important at people um, seeing Santa Claus in the street. So you ask, you know, then the question comes, well, why is this? And my view is that Jesus taught us that we're to give in secret. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yeah, And yeah. so what the Santa tradition did was it made giving be anonymous. Oh, it's not coming from me. It's coming from Santa Claus. And it made it fun. It made it not patronizing. It wasn't mm. like I'm doing really well and you're kind of doing poorly. You've been out of work for four years. So I'm going to, in my generosity, help you. It's like, oh, Santa left that. It's, it's, it's your dignity is kept in play. So like very early on, you have... Santa Claus societies, which are helping the poor. And all they're mm. saying is, 
not only do I want to help the poor, but I don't want to be a snob about it. <laughs> yeah, I want to be yeah. somebody who's like fun and, and, and honoring your dignity. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it was really kind of fun for me to kind of explore the roots of this tradition. Now, I'm not trying to put you too much on the spot here, but have you ever had opportunity to volunteer at a Salvation Army Red Kettle? I haven't, but you know, I deliberately carry lots of cash in my wallet for like two months and I put a lot in every time I see one. I love them. Okay. Uh, 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 and, and I would, and I would love to um, uh, volunteer at one. I think it'd be great fun. I actually, uh, people who knew me, I once had a huge uncut beard. Okay. And some people remember that. Uh, and they often ask me, when is it coming back? And I say, well, if I knew it would come in gray, I would definitely do it. <laughs> so well, well, here's why I ask. I'm not, not just trying to get volunteers, though I'm sure that the, I think the Salvation Army Oak Brook Terrace, uh, talk to our friend, our common friend, Sean O'Pebolo or Brian yes. Styler. They might listen. They'll, they'll hook you up. But th the reason I say is that idea of giving anonymously. Yeah. It's a fascinating study when you're now. I basically grew up on that kettle. Okay. Like yeah. uh, ringing bells. Yeah. Like this is what, and I just, I love the opportunity to stand behind and see people give. One of the things that people always say when the first time that they do it is I couldn't believe the, the person who pulled up in the Mercedes, I thought for sure they'd drop in a 20, but it was a person who came in off the bus or didn't look like they could do it. It was the stories that they would hear, but it also there are people who do not want to look at you when you, mm. when you, you try and say thank you. They don't, it's like a quick move. And also yes. there's this other thing that happens is it's an education. It's a fascinating thing to, to so even if you could just do an hour um, of, of doing and, and I'm not just saying to you, to Tim, but like anybody to go yeah. out to see the way people, they teach their kids about giving yeah. by that, by that kettle. Absolutely. It's a fascinating thing. And that's connected to what you're saying, what the Santa Claus tradition is. You know, it, it, it's a one, it's a wonderful feeling to give. I, I tell this, you know, to, to um, my pastors all the time uh, that people are longing for something meaningful to do with their time and with their money. And if you if you're not exploiting them, if you're not manipulating them, but you actually are genuinely connecting them to here is something meaningful that can be done with your time and money. Uh, you're doing a service to people. They, they yes. want that. They've tried, they're trying to find an outlet. What, I have money. I have time. Uh, if there's a way to connect me with something that you, that is actually genuinely meaningful, that really helps people, that's not just you using me. That is making my life more fulfilling. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you said you said that you have. A, I don't know. Is there there's a scholar of food service or somebody who actually looks into in your <laughs> yeah. Christmas book? Like what they they really look at like the history of the foods in this handbook? You have some? Of yeah, that there absolutely. Too? Yeah, there's an entire there's an entire chapter on food. Of uh, what people eat on Christmas and why Christmas is actually, um, it's fascinating. I told you I did a book on anthropology. Mary Douglas was uh, an anthropologist who talks about this, that, you know, food is a very important way to set apart time as special. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's partly what we do is we have foods that we only eat at certain times of the year. Now you, you could eat them anytime. So why don't you? You could get them anytime, but you're like, you know, some, some of them are literally, you know, either a season or actually a day. Uh, yeah. For myself, I roast a goose every year. Again, you can hear the kind of Dickens uh, behind that. Uh, I do the cooking in our house and, and I only um, make goose once a year and it's on Christmas day. And again, Mary Douglas taught me why I was doing that. It's like, I can find a goose in the supermarket another time and I can afford it, but I don't do it because I'm trying to mark this day as special. Yeah. And this food uh, is a way of saying that, that, that here we're, we're noticing something that's different and it's going to remind us of what this day means to us. Oh, that's beautiful. I think a lot of my uh, colleagues here who uh, I just had just had on my podcast, Matt Friedman, who talked about discipleship in the home and and, and his, he has a new book out on that subject. And he's just trying to find ways to be able to have these moments for your family to highlight this. And, and that fits right in there. I love that. Well, one of the things that's interesting to me, uh, I can definitely, I knew just by reading the back of your books, you're at Wheaton and, um, you know, could piece together a few things and, and then assume that obviously the, like you have a meaningful relationship with Jesus, but here's a, a, a testament to you as a scholar. So this, this, mm. I don't know what your own tradition is. Like, I, could, <laughs> I so I, so congratulations, <laughs> but I'm curious, what's your own spiritual experience? Yeah, I, I, um, most readily identify with the word charismatic. Uh, okay. so, so I think non 
denominational charismatic uh, networks of churches is probably my deepest. I do have Pentecostal roots. Uh, so my mom's family uh, was Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, a holiness Pentecostal denomination. All right. <laughs> and I'm very proud of my um, uncle who served as state overseer for Church of God and actually was um, a pioneer in the uh, ethnic and racial diversity of the denomination. The denomination was primarily a, a white Southern denomination in origin, uh, hence the Tennessee. And he was just very entrepreneurial. We're talking about, you know, William Booth in finding, you know, Haitian parent, uh, groups and all these different uh, immigrant groups and saying, we can hook you up to a wider network and pulling them into the denomination. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my Pentecostal heritage for sure. But I think charismatic is probably a, 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 a uh, a better uh, one word descriptor for who I am. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, I love it. Well, I, I won't just know. I didn't come at, come at it through that perspective. It was later that I was thinking. Yeah. And, I, and again, I appreciate what you were saying because as a historian and I tell my students all of this the time, I, I, I say both, I want you to become, you know, true to yourself and your tradition. Uh, but I want you to understand why somebody else would believe something in that in another tradition and, and the internal logic of what they're doing. So I try to kind of balance those two things to say, when I teach this, I am going to really help you understand how these people think and what matters to them. But mm -hmm. I'm going to teach another day a tradition that disagrees with them. And I'm also going to do the same thing with them. And you have to figure right. out who you are. But you, you need to know who you are, not by caricaturing them and having a straw man, but you have to see the best version of what 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 the what the logic is theologically and biblically of what they're doing and what why it matters to them, but then you have to stand where you stand. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons that I have the the, the name for my podcast is more to the story is connected to the same tradition that we share. You know, going back to Wesley, and that's this the idea. There's more to the story than just experiencing uh, forgiveness or sins, but there's a deeper work that God wants to do in our lives. Yeah. So that's part of it. And I also like to get more to the story of the various books in your writing project. But I, my third reason for having this title, title of the podcast, and I like to ask the question, is there more to the story to Tim Larson than is typically told? Like we know he's a historian. We've learned a little bit about the Christmas side, but is there something that you like to do that you don't get to talk about in these avid, on these type of uh, venues very often? Like, uh, do you like the canoe or something like that? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I follow the question. I, I, I love murder mysteries. I, oh. I have, I have, um, uh, I think I would be embarrassed if uh, I, I have found out a grand total of how many I've read. Uh, I often listen to them on audiobooks. I actually did write one myself, um, which was set at a church history conference <laughs> where people okay. die. Uh, <laughs> so I put together my love of murder mysteries uh, with my uh, deep knowledge of conferences, having gone to so many of them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I'm, I'm currently to, um, uh, fuse a couple lines here. I'm working right now, among other projects, on an anthology of Christmas stories. Um, okay. And one, I'm going to talk to my editor tomorrow, actually. So we'll see if she buys it or not. Uh, but there's a Sherlock Holmes story that's set at Christmas time, and I'm going to see if I can get it in. So, <laughs> oh, that is great. Well, Dr. Larson, thank you so much for your work. Um, it's enriched me, and it's something that's, that's helping me think about my own tradition. And even and, and that uh, impacts the way that I, I serve in my role in training pastors. So I really appreciate the way you dedicate yourself to your, your discipline. And um, so just thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It means a lot to me. God bless you and your listeners, Andy. <laughs>